Hello and welcome back to the Apprentice One to One podcast. It is me, Mark, and I'm joined again by Richard and Craig. We've got together tonight to run over the design webinar we did last week. We didn't quite finish off the whole scenario, and there's been a few questions pop up during the course of the week on social media, which is great to see people watching us and passing comment on what we're doing. Before we get into all of that, how are you, Richard? Very well, thanks, Matt. Enjoying the uh, the sunshine while we can before we end up with our snow boots on and all that jazz, scarves and stuff. So, yeah, trying to get the most of that. Busy, busy, obviously at work. Um, trying to support our good friend um, Pegasus Electrical Eddie with his safer September. I'm actually popping out to sing tomorrow. So I'm going to record a couple of little videos. And obviously that coincides with the relaunch of uh, our best practice guide too. So... Yeah, happy to do that. Um, just busy, mate. Yeah, all good, all good, all good. I saw the best practice guide too on social media. It might have been the back end of last week or early this week. And it looks brilliant. A lot of the images updated. There's a lot of beef and meat on the bones in all of that. Good to see yeah. some topics mentioned. And just to mention Eddie, what an absolute yeah. superstar he is. So <laughs> yeah, I'm sure nice you'll guy. have a good natter with him. <laughs> yeah, and you know, there's loads of things to talk about in there with, you know, phenolic degradation and all sorts of things, you know, lots of stuff that's floating around within our industry, but certainly topics that are under discussion with the RAG, which is, you know, Wine Regulations Action Group. We're looking at things like that, which is not necessarily clear in our, our standard in the regs or it's not within our standard. Um, so it's quite a lot of conversation uh, going on. But, it's, yeah, it's all good. It's all good, man. All good. Thank you. Awesome. And yourself, Craig, how are you? Yeah, good. I'm uh... Back at work this week, so you know it's a bit more depressing than last week. The sunshine <laughs> makes everything like but well, ten times as hard. Like I just end up spending my day like a fat man in a sweet shop trying to work out how not to be dripping in sweat being Scottish and it's over twelve degrees. <laughs> it is really warm, isn't it? It's mad. <laughs> Driving back today and I think we'd hit thirty four degrees down here. Wow. Like, September is just to start autumn soon. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's like, isn't the sunshine lovely? I mean, no, I'd rather have the rain. Yeah, true. I mean, we've been cracking on with this with the solar stuff while the sun's out, trying to get a lot of that buttoned up. I've uh, taken on, a, I think it's five commissions this week, and they've all been an absolute nightmare with the internet and getting software to play ball. <laughs> It's a whole new world for us as electricians. But you allow kind of an an hour, you think, to try and get some on the internet. But it turns out you actually need five or six. So my week's not been going great. <laughs> I had one a while ago where um, something to do with a new. We put, I think, we put a PIR up to or a time clock to do with somebody's outside light as a favour at the home, and because they'd only had five G on the router and not two G or something, there was no compatibility, and it won't work. And it's as you say, it's a whole new world. We're having to check compatibility of people's internet to install devices that normally we would have just wired with cable once upon a time it's crazy isn't it it's crazy and when you're doing a, a battery storage system alongside an inverter and the manufacturers have got it set up where they both update at the same time but when one of them <laughs> goes offline the other one starts alarming and then it restarts over and over again it's a nightmare but we won't go down that rabbit hole at the start of the podcast we'll maybe come back to it later <laughs> on wanted to touch on on the design webinar last week really and really to feed back to you guys there's been a lot of positive comments around it which has been really nice there's been well well viewed and watched and listened to on um the old download figures so i think it's something that people out there are enjoying um one of the questions that came back was to do with the correction factors and we did kind of discuss this offline i think i've had chats with both of you around that and it's the application of the the 90 degree correction factor or the 70 degree did anybody want to have a little dig into that yeah i'll start and um, i can jump in if he likes um yeah the correction factors you've got to apply is dependent upon the insulation that's surrounding the conductor so as we know xlpa is capable of running up to 90 degrees so ultimately we've got to allow for the fact within the selection of the size of cable because the cable probably won't run up to that temperature but it could so ultimately, it's going to have an effect on our value of IZ, which is the minimum current the cable needs to carry for continuous service. And consequently, it will affect the size of the cable that you're going to select, IT. If we don't allow for it, even though they're only very small margins, they're, they're 0.0 of a, you know, whatever it may be, 
Um, in effect, we might be undersizing the cable. So it's unlikely we're ever going to reach 90 degrees, but we may. And don't forget, when we're using table 4D4A, the 70 degree cable, it's based on the fact that the equipment can't cope with that temperature, the cable can. And consequently, we need to allow for that because ultimately it's going to affect the size of the cable. But if you think about your resistance per milliamp per meter, if we lay 1.28, which is 90 degree, it's allowing for a, a bit of a buffer, worst case scenario, because in effect, the cable can run to 90 degrees and then we know heat is directly proportional to resistance. So the more heat, the more resistance. If we don't allow for it, cable could overheat. Potentially, we could be in trouble setting fire to something, etc. So, you know, we do need to apply the 90 degree value purely for the correction factors, but not for the selection of the cable because the equipment can't deal with it. So Craig might be able to add a little bit or explain that slightly better, but you must allow for it as a designer. So, Not, not necessarily slightly better. I would take a different stance on it. Um, and I think this is the joy of design is if you can justify your chosen decisions, then that would be your reason. So the way that I view it, um, as I view it, that the derating factors are about the current carrying capacity of the cable, or in the adiabatic equation, because I have a different stance on that to the rest of this conversation. So if I'm running a cable at 70 degrees, I would personally apply the rating factors at 70 degrees because that's going to give me the worst case of the cable that I am designing and installing in its worst condition. So running that cable at 70 degrees, regardless of if it's a 90 degree cable, I'm almost not factoring that for anything other than the adiabatic because if I'm looking at grouping and everything else, then planning it at 70 degrees may give me a bigger cable, but I've allowed the worst case scenario within that design because um, the colder the cable, obviously the worse it's going to deal with that situation. So I base the derating factors of the table on the connections of the conductors, but... I fully agree as far as I'm aware, which could be wrong. There isn't a reg that says you go one way or the other. So to me, it's about can you justify your decisions as a designer? I personally, if I'm rating a cable at 70 degrees, I treat the whole cable at 70 degrees. The adiabatic is different because I agree that is about the insulation and how long it takes for thermal withstand and all of those other things. So I would use a 90 degree factor when it came to that because that is about the insulation breaking down on the cable itself rather than the current carrying capacity. But anything to do with the current carrying, I would calc at 70 degrees. But that is not me saying I'm right. That is me saying that's the way I choose to go based on my engineering judgment for that topic. And I think the both those two views that you've expressed there are a perfect example of the design approach we can we can take. I don't think there's any real right answer to that. I asked the um iet technical line and the kind of comeback from them was it's kind of up to the designer you can yeah. have a, a distance between the equipment and the cable say when it's leaving the ground leading up to it um and it all plays a part there's no real one size fits all and i guess that's where the expertise comes in being a designer i suppose applying the intent of all of that it's a bit well, like last be week, you've got, you've got multiple installation methods you don't apply all of them you apply the worst case. So if you look at, and um, we'll have a look at how we calculate R1, R2, for instance, in a minute. If we apply the 70 degree value, you're going to get a lower R1, R2, and indeed a lower ZS, which might be close to the max ZS. If you apply the 90 degree value, because potentially you could run the cable to that, your R1, R2 is going to go up. But ultimately, as long as your R1, R2 plus your, Z, uh, your ZS is underneath the max allowed, you're going to be compliant. So as, as you know, Craig, Craig rightly says, you're signing the design part of that installation certificate. So whatever decisions you make, and it's all about engineering judgment, et cetera, and there's fine margins between them, as we'll say, and it could mean the difference between installing a 4 mil cable or a 6 mil, or when you go bigger scale, 120 mil or 150 mil, and, you know, the consequences of not only the cost of the cable, but the amount of labor you need and the graft you need and the hydraulic crimping tools and all the other, all the you know, it, 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 it's all down to the designer, isn't it? And that's why it's quite inter it's quite an interesting subject, but it's it's good, yeah. What I would actually be interested to see is, and I've never done this, so somebody may have proven this, but I'm kind of looking at Mark because he loves a garden experiment with his place. <laughs> is, yeah, that's good. 
I would I would be curious if you took the current carrying capacities of say a seventy degree four mil armoured and a ninety degree four mil armoured, and put the current through it that the um, regs book says it can handle, if it actually reached its operating temperature, or if there is actually another buffer in there that we don't plan for, well not don't plan for, but we aren't allowed to plan for, if you know what there I mean. Must be. There must on be. the actual manufacturer's cable anyway. Yeah. You know, does does a four mil carrying fifty amps just for argument's sake, don't kill me for quoting the number wrong. Um for an hour, because I think they say about forty five minutes a cable should get to temperature. Does it yeah. actually hit 70 degrees or does it actually hit 90 degrees or is it more like 35, 40 degrees and that element is already there to back us up anyway? I'd be really curious to do that and I might it, see if I can do something with it. There's always going to be a buffer, isn't there? Because the regs is is or allows for a buffer, if that makes sense. Ultimately, if you wanted to know the actual values, and that might be something Doncaster Cables or one of the bigger cable manufacturers would probably do for us. They might be able to set up a nice little experiment there uh, and go and find out. But ultimately, the current carrying capacity is based on the product standard for the cable. So within table 4A3 of the regs, it lists all the product specification numbers, doesn't it? You know, BS5467, blah, 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 et cetera. So the manufacturer is making the cable to that standard as a minimum. Uh, and as we've seen with that uh, Doncaster EV cable, it's made not to a standard that's recognised currently, you could argue is made to maybe a better standard you know so again designer isn't it? it you know you're designing it you've got to make sure that it's compliant with everything within 7671 but also you've got to make sure it's safe haven't you and ultimately that's what it's all about it is i think i'm in this kind of sorry craig go on so i was going to say and this is why i always go back to my pet peeve and i will never get over this i don't care how many years we do this for <laughs> when people say oh but i'm not the designer i just chuck it in <laughs> no, you are. I'm sorry. You are the designer. If you're going to connect it and you're going to install it, you are designing it to some extent. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll be honest with that particular question. I wasn't 100% sure of the answer because I've been using OM for a while now and I just tick the 70 degree button and it, it does it all. So I wasn't 100%. And I think having dug into it, you're both kind of right. There's no wrong answer there. How no. City and Guilds or EAL, if they've got an equivalent course, might view the right answer in that type of situation, I guess we'd have to check. And maybe some of the people out there teaching these courses might be able to answer that question for us. But it's, a, it's an interesting discussion point, and it's good to see that the audience are kind of taking what we're yeah. saying and um, developing and building on the discussion around it. I love that, personally. I think it's really good. Well, I think City and Guilds kind of shy away from it a little bit. I've never taught EEL, so I'm not sure if it's the same. But the on-site guide doesn't have armoured cable in it on the tables anymore, so they kind of remove that from needing to be a conversation when it comes to students' exam questions. Nice because... <laughs> <laughs> Which is a shame, actually. It's a shame. But I'm sure it's a coincidence. Yeah, it's in the regs, but... Yeah, I mean, you know, ultimately it's down to the designer. And as Craig quite rightly says, as long as it can be justified, because it's the designer's, the designer, his, his choices, his decisions, his engineering judgment, and any projects that ever came back to me through the 5357 apprenticeship standard, which was a hotel project, which was quite good, you know, given the bare bones to do it. But they're the designer, I know anything from diversity to table selection, whatever, as long as they can justify their choice and it's within the scope or the standard and it's, there's a, there's a good engineering decision being made and they can justify it. Who am I to say that, that they're wrong? It's, you know, ultimately they're going to sign the cert moving forward. And if it goes wrong, they're going to have to explain themselves in a court of law, aren't they? Simple as that. It's true. And there's there's been some other yeah. discussions pop up on social media, not really related to our scenario, but some other kind of developing chats. And one of them involved Mr. Bridgman and his yeah. rewire he's been doing at home. I don't think either of you two are on, on Twitter. Um, but he's designed a very long upstairs ring final circuit that is basically just to power his Sonos speakers. So there's very, very low load on there. <laughs> it's not intended for doing anything else, but he's used the design current for that based upon the actual load that he's anticipating to be used rather than the overcurrent protected device or work into the, is it 26 ohms, I think, uh, sorry, 26 amps um, that they based yeah, that on for a right. 32 amp ring final circuit. So I think his actual current in the calculation was 13 amps and a few people 
got a bit upset with him about that because his R1, R2 values would lead towards it being non-compliant if it was carrying those 26 amps. So I just wonder what you two thought about that, using a design current on a socket circuit that's maybe not the textbook 26 amps, 32 amps, whatever we're going to use. For me, the formula for working out a circuit starts with IB, right? So if you can justify your IB, and if he's happy, he's at a point where there is no overload, um, and he can control that current in a controlled manner, and he's a skilled person by all sorts of accounts. Um, debatable, debatable. <laughs> <laughs> but, but then, crucially, he's applied his engineering judgment, hasn't he, as the designer? Yeah. This is what we're saying. Sorry, Craig. No, I was I was agreeing with that. I was just going to say that he's a skilled person. He's done his design. He knows what his connected load analysis is. And if you can justify that, then why not? I mean, the worst case for me is actually the opposite way when everybody goes, well, 100 metres, you know, as a ring, tuck it in, roll a thumb. I'd far rather have somebody doing it the way that Neil is doing it and understand that thought process rather than the opposite side. So to me... I don't have a, an issue between 13 amps and 20 amps. I would rather somebody's applied that process effectively to their design and then installed to that measure. So I don't have an issue, to be honest. And, and you know, don't forget that ring final circuits were brought about in the 1940s or whenever it was, weren't they, to reduce the amount of cable that's being used, but also to say, look, you know, let's put a high-powered ring in where we can spread the load. And in effect, we've got two ways of spreading load around the circuit, the problems you get are when it becomes a radial circuit. And as we know, on a 32 amp device, it ain't going to trip at 32 amps. It's going to be between three and five times the rating of it, isn't it? And by that time, you're going to go over your, your thermal limit, limiting temperature of the cable, potentially. And therefore, it's going to set on fire. But with a ring final circuit, with the number of socket outlets, you can't control what loading there's going to be. So somebody could quite possibly overload it. And then you could be... In, in, in a whole world of trouble, but he knows the load and it's only very relatively small load. So nice and all that. I've got all that myself. So I'm familiar with his pain, but equally as Craig quite rightly said, he's the, he's the designer. There isn't any, anybody else that's going to be using that circuit only himself. And he's you know aware of the fact that it's limited to the load. So therefore there's never going to be an issue. Is there? No. And I think that rings were part of the, I think during the time of war, wasn't it? The you used to get like a five amp socket, 15 amp socket and something else. And you traditionally had a couple of sockets downstairs and a couple of sockets upstairs. And you could only put your Hoover in one type of socket and could only put your iron in another type of socket. And the concept of rings was generally, as you say, to save a bit of cable, but to try and then standardize sockets to what we know sockets to be now. So, and I think the cable used to be a 2.5 cable used to power a sort of a 15 amp socket. And then magically they decided it will calculate rings on 20 amps and not 32 amps, because if you do your design on 32 amp, your cable sizes generally come out about six mil by the time you've started taking your rating factors in. Um, so they went, well, what size cable does a ring? And they go, well, 2.5 does 15 amps. So let's say 2.5 does 20 amps. So therefore if we put two of them in, then we get more than the 32 amps and, so the science behind it already is probably maybe a little bit skew if during the time of war. So I think Neil's method may be a bit more accurate. Yeah. And yeah. you've got the installation method as well, haven't you? You've got to consider if it's a bungalow, you're probably going to have reference method 100 or something, maybe worse, insulation on the cable. And back then you only used to have a 1 mil CPC as well. So you've got to consider that. And, of course, a ring final is great, but the idea of it is um, that you spread the load across all the you know different legs of the ring so really you shouldn't wire a ring as you would conventionally wire it you should kind of stagger it to try and make sure that you're never going above 20 amps on a particular leg which you know can be quite well, difficult. and that's the point when people wire the rings isn't it mm -hmm. the ring is supposed to be the highest point of a ring is supposed to be in the middle of the ring now for me from what i see most people pull one side all the way to the end and then on the last socket take it from mm -hmm. there all the way back to the board well, we're not wiring rings in the way that they were designed anyway. So, no, no, no. but that's why I love it to say, yeah, that they're fundamentally flawed, aren't they? And people yeah, yeah. will, you know, regardless of whether someone's messed with it and then you end up with two radials or whatever, is is a radial, uh, you know, system a better system? 
maybe they just everything on the radio individually, yeah. you know, protected wish, and whatever. Wish, wish. We should have got Neil on to talk about his design. There is a reason he's not gone yeah. for radio. It's to do with the the insulation in his new house that he's doing. He's getting air source heat pumps, yeah. solar panels, massive amount of insulation, and he didn't want to be pulling four mil radials in yeah. to take spares off to his Sonos's. So it was all the mm-hmm. wires in one place, and you know there is there is factors in there, but of course as well another kind of sub discussion that came up off that is he's got a TT supply to his house. So he's got a, an upfront time delayed RCD, and then he's got his final circuits on AFDDs. So there was somebody who raised the question of your um, short circuit protection between line and neutral if you've got yeah. that very long ring final uh, circuit. Yeah. And if yeah. the overload could go beyond his design current, the scenario you described, Richard, there with the, the yeah. thermal constraints of the cable. But of course, yeah. when we yeah. use the design current, because he knows the design, we'll imagine yeah. he's got key switches on every socket and a data logger monitoring it on his desk so he knows what's going on you know they still it's still covered off it is still covered off yeah, for exactly. that so as, as we say he knows his stuff doesn't he he's, he's, he's applied his engineering judgment and if he's questioned about it or there's a problem with it he can justify it at every stage and he's covered his bases more than once <laughs> yeah i mean that'd be fantastic that would yeah and why not you know there's so many fantastic knowledgeable engineers sparks out there that apply their engineering judgment based on a number of factors that you might not consider and yeah why not you know absolutely brilliant yeah better from the mm. horse's mouth so if you're watching neil i know you do watch from time to time you were on the webinar last week get yourself along and explain yourself regarding this dodgy ring final circuit you put upstairs in your house i um, mean the... sorry craig i was going to say for me as we said a general as general as you can be, the ring is generally my last choice of a way to install a circuit personally because for all the factors that we mentioned. Yeah, it, it's still a versatile solution when there is a lot of insulation piled into a domestic house. I've been there and when you are trying to think about spares mm-hmm. and 20 amp double pole isolators and getting all of your equipment into them and you know your radial circuit's going to have to be 4 mil. You do start looking towards that old two point five mil ring final circuit. <laughs> I've got to be honest; it becomes a more attractive position. If you've never tried to bodge two four mils or two six mils in the back of a socket, you've never lived. No, it's a it's a fun time, especially if it's LSF. <laughs> that's even more fun. Yeah. <laughs> Just give him a haircut, the bear. That's it. That's it. And so, the, the final before we get into Richard's additional questions, because I do want to go in, go into all of that. Um, somebody raised the issue of the max ZS value that you would record on a TT system. So yeah. that would be for a 30 milliamp RCD. Now, I'll, I'll say my view first. In the regs, there's guidance towards this 200 um, earth electrode. But for me, that it's asking for the max value yeah. for the particular overcurrent protected device. So if it's a 30 milliamp RCD, I would put 1,667 yeah. ohms on a TT. Yeah. Yeah. Because that is the max allowed. In the supply characteristics, I would note the impedance of the earth electrode. And then in the recorded ZS, that's obviously the recorded value. Then you've got all of the information in all those places. But some people had suggested putting 200 ohms in that max ZS value because kind of you're limited by the electrode. I wonder what you two thought about that one. I've never... I've never heard of the 200 ohms being used as a ZS value. Yes, that's the the border of when they talk about a TT potentially becoming unstable and all the rest of it. I understand that. I would agree with you at every point on that, that you've got the table in the regs, haven't you, of the max values, depending on whether it's 30 milliamp, 500 milliamp, 300 milliamp. I would personally be recording those values I suppose as a consequence of saying, well, if it was a circuit breaker, why do you record the ZS value of that table and not not 0.35 if it's a TNCS system? So for me, I would be going to the ZS values of the 1667 ohms on a 30 milliamp RCD personally. I agree. Richard, any view on that? It comes back again, doesn't it, to shock protection we were talking about, or it's part of the you know, the cable calculation, cable selection process and confirming that your chosen protective measure will work. So ADS, got a 30 milliamp device, it's Ohm's law, isn't it? So voltage divided by your resistance, uh, your resistance or, you know, I, I times R, etc. So for a 30 milliamp device, it's quite rightly table 41.5 says, anything under 
1667 in effect will disconnect the device within the required time. Anything over that, it's not going to happen. So the max is actually from table 41.5 because that's what it's asking for when you fill out your schedule of test results. In terms of you know being no more than 200 ohms, it's all about having a stable, reliable value, isn't it? Because we all know that depending on the soil type and temperature changes, ground temperature and all that, will have an effect on resistance. And in effect, if you were very close to that maximum and it goes over it, it's never going to disconnect. So you might make a note, and I might make a note, but ultimately you're looking for the lowest value you can for your ZE, aren't you? So your electrode test you carry out, whether you do the proper test using the proper instrument or, you know, a ZE using your perspective, uh, your a thought loop impedance tester, you're looking for something as low as you can. And if you can get that below 200, then you're never going to be nowhere near your 1667. But I don't know, let's say it was four or 500 ohms. Ultimately, as long as you're within 1667, you add your R1, R2, you're still compliant, aren't you? Yeah. So that's that's also right. why... That's oh, also yeah. why you're using the RCD though as well, isn't it? Because you've got that better appendix for that says if you can't meet a ZS time... Then you can use an RCD yeah, sort of protection. overlay protection to use that for fault protection to therefore mitigate the requirement of the ZS time. So if you put that, if you put an RCBOs on your final circuits, you're almost double covering yourself on that. But I would still go back to the 1667, like we said. Yeah. I mean, if you're putting a TT in and you're getting 200 ohms, there's probably something not quite right anyway, I would suggest from. Most of the ones I've seen, people aren't getting up as high as 200 ohms. Yeah, it's unusual. I'd say usually we're kind of under 100. But I think in some of the more harder ground areas, it's possible where you've driven a few rods in and you've still not yeah. got there. And it's like, you know, how how long do you keep banging more rods in? It's it's one of those. I think the issue is in winter, isn't it, when the ground freezes? It can really you affect can. those values, yeah. especially if you haven't gone deep and you've just got a single rod in. Um, so I guess they are. It's that stability, isn't it, Richard? You you pretty much nailed yeah. it with that. They're just trying to ensure that there is a reliable earth path there to disconnect it all to be... se all seasons. Yeah. Stable. That's that's the key. It's got to be stable, but it's got to be stable over, you know, fluctuations in ground temperature, air temperature, moisture, types of soil. You get you know you get into BS seven four thirty then, and it gets a whole new world of pain with lots more calculations and stuff. But ultimately, you're looking for two hundred or less, aren't you? As low as you can. Add your R1, R2, you, you're going to be well within. You're never going to achieve your zero point or your one point, whatever you need for a normal protective device because you'll never generate enough fog for it. But of course, you need a lot lower amount of current to disconnect an RCD. So many amps don't here exactly. 0 0.03 0 of an amp will disconnect it and disconnect it super quick with a bit of luck. So, you know, as Craig but says, there are occasions where as the designer, you can't meet the max NS and we are allowed to use an RCD for fault protection, which you generally would on a TT system, or where you've got a circuit where the length is so extreme, uh, or whatever it is, you can't make, it's not, you know, it's allowed, but it's not a great design, but there might be a reason why you just can't do it, you can't achieve it, so why not? But I also think that's a case of applying that engineering judgment we keep talking about. If you're getting 200 ohms on a scorching, on a, um, sorry, really wet winter's day, and you're leaving and walking away at 200 ohms on that day, it's probably not the value you needed by the time it becomes summer or winter, is it? By yeah, no. as everything starts to firm up a little bit. So it's just that little bit of knowledge and that way that you choose to apply it. I think. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, ex exactly. Yeah, good that. question. Well, that's good. Yeah, it's good. And this it is, is, you know, yeah. these types of questions are always a good little debate and a conversation. You know, I like that. We had an interesting one on a, a TNCS. We reported a fault to the DNO because we'd got a value. I think it was around not point nine ohms or something. And obviously that was swinging out the max ZS values on a number of um, circuits, especially the sockets in this place. So we took the decision to stick an earth electrode in anyway alongside the DNOs air because it seemed apt to disconnect something that's still got a much lower value we'd achieve off the electrode. But we put a time-delayed RCD in up front as well yeah, just to try and kind of mitigate it as best we could. And the DNO point blank refused to do anything about that. So that was kind of left as is. I don't know if that's um, their approach to it now. As long as there's a value they're happy with, they're going to leave it. It's uh, That was only maybe six months ago. It wasn't that long ago, really. But I think yeah, that's but... the thing with the DNO and people remembering, isn't it? Is they work 
to a different set of standards than what we do as electricians. So BS7671 tell us what a TNCS system should be and whatever else, but the DNO maybe aren't working to those same values potentially. Yes, they true. are, but there, there is a particular part of the ESQCR regulation, so I'd have to dig a little bit because I've come across it before, where if they're providing you with a service, which they are, you've got to maintain have to it, haven't they? <laughs> Absolutely, they've got to meet certain criteria. So there is a particular part of the ESQCR you have to quote back to them, but nine times out of ten, they'll then come and rectify it. Yeah, Unless, this was the... for safety reasons, they can't. I think it was a cost reason on this one. It was the on the end of a very, very long country right. driveway with an overhead supply that then dropped underground and they PME'd a few installations that maybe they shouldn't have done with hindsight. And yeah, yeah that was where it was and they weren't prepared to do anything about it. But there you go. We're delving yeah, into you know, another rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah, but again, another good conversation because as the designer and the installer yourself and ultimately you're going to certificate the job, you kind of you can't just ignore it. And think, oh, that's okay. It doesn't matter because it's affected the design. So what are you going to do to mitigate that issue? That's not our issue necessarily, but ultimately you've still got to make sure it complies and it's safe. So you took the choice or the decision to install an additional electrode to supplement their PMA supply, and that's that's what you'd have to do in it, and that's what you've done. So it's good. Again, engineering judgment. Seemed like the best in the circumstances. Yeah. Shall we delve into these questions that you had at the end of that, yeah. that sheet? Are you going to share your screen, Richard? I'm going to try. Going I'm going to press the button and see what happens. Yeah. Is it just okay, that one? So, yeah, the first one is the cable cut, and I'll just show you the, the little bit of a, a caveat I put in there. And then, of course, the, the answers is the little bits on the end that I've added some stuff to today. Yeah, just make sure. So if you bust the, the first one, cable selection, and I was hoping that people would have clocked something, another little little trick I put in there that nobody clocked. <laughs> you know, but but obviously, I did. I just don't want to mention it, though. Yeah, so I, did. I didn't want to show off either. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's and see actually, if this will share. Go for it when you're ready. Yeah. Okay, so last week, then, we run through the, the cable selection process. And like previous podcasts, we've had a look at a little bit of a caveat in the regs that talks about using IB instead of IT, where you've got no chance of overload. So last week, we spoke about all these different correction factors we've got to consider. So ground, air to, uh, ground temperature, where the cable is buried, the depth of burial, and the resistivity of the soil. So we said last week that we'd probably use 10 mil, and we did a calculation. But actually, we overlooked the fact that this EV charger can never overload. So if you can't overload, why am I applying a factor for when it's buried in the ground for overload? <laughs> so when you look at 5.2 within Appendix 4, when we look at the formula that we applied last week where overload protection is not required because it's not, there's a little note under it that says where overload uh, protection is not required, the value for CC is actually 1. So in other words, you don't need to worry about it. So consequently, our uh, IZ, the, amount, the maximum amount of current the cable needs to carry continuously now is 36.52 amps. When we go to table uh, 4D, 4A, we're looking for a cable reference method D that can carry at least 30, uh, 36.52 amps. We can actually select 4 mil and not 6 mil. Interesting. Interesting. I did not spot that when we were running through that. I'll be honest myself, last week I just saw the CC value and that's oh. what you're used to looking at. No. That's an interesting... Okay. Interesting chain of thought on that one. And consequently, as you as you scroll down now, that's now going to affect our R1, R2 value. It's going to affect our volt drop as well, sorry. So now for 4 mil, um, we've got a millivolts per amp per meter value um, of 11 millivolts per amp per meter. So actually our volt drop now equates to a calculated volt drop based on our design current length, 9.2 volts. Still compliant, still well within 11.5. So 4 mil still works there. Then we've got to check our shocks protection. So as we go down, nothing's changed there. We've got a different value now for our uh, resistivity of our R1, R2. So as we go down, there it is. So now we're looking for in table uh, I1 of the on-site guide, combination of 4 mil, 4 mil. And we can see there, I put that in, gives us 9.22 milliohms per amp per meter. So you add that in now into our equation, times it by our... Um, uh, length and by our uh, factor 
of 1.2 to a loaf of the fat of 1.28, it should be. It's going to make it go up slightly because it's a smaller size cable ultimately. And again, we've used our 90% thermo setting value of, of 1.28. Now, if we'd have used 1.2, our R1, R2 value would be less. So Craig's quite right in saying, well, I'll use 70 degrees, but let's say that the cable could get up to 90, which it could do. The equipment couldn't be able to cope with it, but the cable could. It, all it does is it affects your R1, R2 value. So ultimately, this gives us a bit of a buffer because it's more than what it would have been at 70. So we combine that with our ZA. As long as it's under our ZS, which it is at 1.09, that's going to disconnect well within the required time. Happy with that. So based on 4 mil then, we can then go down just to check our minimum size CPC. Because it's 4 mil and our uh, ZS value has changed, our perspective earth fault current value is going to change. It's now 511 amps. Is it still more than what's required to disconnect out of 40 amp um, RCBO? We need a minimum of 200. So it's not going to affect the disconnection time. It's way above the max that it's required. So it's going to disconnect in point one. We can then apply that into our adiabatic as we go down to verify our size of CPC. So now we've got 511 amps. Our disconnection time's the same. Our K value, again, that we chose last week is still 143 because it's 90 degree thermo setting. So now we need a minimum size CPC of 1.13 millimeters squared. We're using a four mil three core cable, so it's well within. So we could use four mil, but you've got a little buffer there, 36 and a little bit amps. We need to, to carry 37, oh, sorry, minimum is 36 and a half. It will carry 37. Me and Dave had a conversation about this. He's at judo tonight, otherwise he'd be, he'd be here to add his little bit of input. He wouldn't be comfortable with putting four mil in. He'd probably still put six mil based upon the price difference probably isn't a lot. He'd probably still go with six, even though four would work. I don't know what you guys, would you still put six? Would you go four? What do you think? I just think everything's an offset and an off cost, isn't it? So for what you gain back in size of cable, you affect other readings and other factors, which based on your engineering judgment at the time on this scenario, it doesn't make a difference. But if you were... 1.07 or 1.08 with a max ZS of 1.09, are you better to go to a bigger cable to bring your ZS factor down and understanding that within your design, every decision you make has a positive and negative effect on that design scenario and how you apply that judgment. So I don't know how I would go, to Four be honest. I guess I would... <laughs> What you what would you do, Mark? Would you I'd go, I'd go with this? I'd go with it. I'd go with a six. Yeah. Um, okay. same reasons as as Dave, to be fair, to yep. kind of allow a bit of extra capacity in the cable. But it is that that cost equation, isn't it? On a smaller project, you know, the cost is is negligible. If you've got a few of these circuits running out, you know, maybe it's there and it's a worthwhile engineering decision for the designer to make, depending on what budget they've been allocated, I suppose. It's well, that's the beauty of design, isn't it? You can kind yep. of Engineering play with things again. and if it works and it's safe then you can do it there is the other aspect that kind of kind of got talked about being introduced i think at the start of the 18th edition of the regs where they're on about using large size conductors to reduce environmental consumption of energy wasn't it i think so if you're using yeah, a larger con conductor you can have yeah. less heat waste basically through your installation yeah so there's that aspect i don't think they ever really properly brought that in as far as i understand anyway whether that's going to come in yeah, well, it's based, it's based on another international standard where it's all part of the prosuming, you know, world of things. So it will energy efficiency. It will come back at, at some stage. But as you quite rightly say, the, the idea was maybe to, in, instead of having the main switch room at one end of the building, they would have it maybe in the centre of the building, which would then reduce your lengths and cable sizes and all that type of stuff. Because we generally oversize everything, don't we? Generally. We do, yeah. And the, the other side of it is, although they haven't officially got that, and as far as I'm aware, like you're talking about, Mark, um, I don't know what you're seeing, but in the commercial jobs that we're looking at, the clients are all pushing to hit certain EPC ratings and certain energy efficiencies and being green, for I hate that term, but being green <laughs> and however unambiguous that is, is helping you get points towards getting your plan and permission and stuff approved because it's fitting in with the the government's agenda. So however you get to that point as a designer, you are having to put some considerations into stuff, even if they're not in the regs, like 
I've just had to be involved in one where we've had to come up with different solutions to make sure that they could hit a certain EPC rate and otherwise they weren't allowed to move forward with the project. It wouldn't get approved through planning permission if they couldn't show that they'd given a set amount back, for example. And that ended up determining the difference between three different types of lights that one of them had to be used as the end product because that one was the one that was the most efficient and had the best EPC rate and regardless of what the client may or may have preferred on looks. It was, well, you you factor this and you use this or you don't get approval to do the work. So it is definitely an undertone that's hidden in there, but I would say that always cost comes back to be key. That is, we could all design the most perfect, safest installation, right? But it would probably cost 12 times more than what anybody was ever willing to pay. So cost will always be king. Yeah, absolutely. For sure. So that kind of wraps wraps that up. Um, but obviously, you've got a copy of that, Mark, so you can reshare that out. Um, I will. See, see what people think. I will. I'll drop that onto the website alongside the other files. And you've kind of sent this one across, Richard. Am I running through these? To yeah, the so this, this, is, this is the answers. And again, most of the questions are in relation to all the calcs that we've done on that separate document. But there was a couple of questions at the end that I added in, probably nine, if you go up slightly. Nine. Yeah, let's uh, go up to that one there. Right, and that there talks about uh, verify from the manufacturer's technical guidance that you've got compliance with regulation 722.411.4.1. Now, that talks about if we've got a PME supply, that we're not allowed to install a charger at full stop unless you comply with four options that we've got. And the four options are one of them is to install supplementary electrodes or an electrode system. But your RA value, in other words, your, your total impedance value of your electrode system has got to be sufficiently low to supplement the PMA. And when you do the calculation, you need under one ohm or half an ohm. So it's probably never going to be achievable. Then you've got to rely on technology. And it gives us three different indents that manufacturers can follow. So indent three, four, and five. So what we need to do is establish from the manufacturer's information what indent to that regulation that they are using within their technology so when you're looking there this is directly out of their technical information it says that they've got an advanced uh, s pen technology and it's compliant with 722.411.4.1 so in down five says that we can use a different type of technology that's different to options three and four but is no less safe and they're saying that they're happy to do that if we do that there is a note in the regulations that talks about section 11 obviously doesn't deal with the safety requirements doesn't doesn't cover electric equipment within the scope. So it says that what we're going to need to do is to get the declaration of conformity off the manufacturer, and we need to append that or add it to the certification for initial verification. So as long as we've got something off the manufacturer that declares that they've complied with various product standards and all the rest of it, and we attach it with the certification, as long as we've got that, it says, where the above is satisfied, it is not considered to be a departure from the regs. It is. So as you scroll down, you'll see that I've included the conformity certificate, and you can get that direct from the manufacturer. We've got that off Simpsons and Partners, whatever they're called. It's freely available. And as far as we're concerned, we've then handed the responsibility back to them because they've done all the product testing. We don't know anything about products. We don't know if it's going to work. But they're declaring that they take full responsibility for that technology in that charger, and we'd need to attach that with that EIC. Happy days. Because there's always been a debate, well, is it a departure? Is it not? Actually not, because the reg says, as long as you've got that, no problem. Not a good one. Happy days. Happy with that. But our yeah, cable yeah. would still be just for clarity. For a yeah, I'll come into that. The cable come we've chosen. Okay. Yeah, come into that. Come into that one. So then, question 10. Again, this is just a little bit more, you know, maybe a bit of thought, a bit of conversation. Any other considerations that we might need to consider um, within the regs. So what about regulation 443.4, everyone's favorite, over voltage control. And just to remind everyone, I put a copy of the reg there, transient over voltages, and these are just from uh, indirect lightning, nothing to do with switching, because that's a separate consideration you might need to cons consider. It says protection against transient over voltage, voltages shall be provided. So you must do it where we've got possibility of serious injury, loss of human life, 
within the um, the latest um, Corridendium, Corridendium to 7671, I got rid of the indent two. That's gone. Or could it cause significant financial or data loss? So this is a question. This technology then that relying that we are relying upon within this charge, and it's all electronics, and it conforms with indent five. If that doesn't work because there's been an over voltage and it, it damages the electronics or whatever, could it cause serious injury or loss of human life? If it could, you've got to do it. If you don't consider it, it is, then you've got to consider the little caveat bit underneath, which talks about for all other, uh, all other cases, um, it's down to the owner of the installation to declare that you know any loss or damage is tolerable uh, and any risk or damage to equipment is a consequential loss. But that charge is about 800 quid. So you've got to consider the technology in it. Could it be damaged? If it could and it could kill someone, you've got no choice. Again, engineering judgment. Or do you believe that it should be won anyway? Because if it was to fry it, you've got to replace it and you wouldn't go back on warranty, would it? They'd say, well, you haven't followed 7671, so you can swing on it. What I've also added in is Beamer's, um, it hasn't been updated for a while, but it's still quite good. If you're not familiar with Beamer guides, there's a direct link to it there. Fantastic guide on all different types of SPDs, your line protection zones, where you should, where you shouldn't use them, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't know what you guys I, think. You know, what do you think? <laughs> I was going to say that I would love to see, just with your influence, a bit more explanation how you justify what is serious injury to or loss. Obviously, loss of human life is quite clear. But serious injury based on whose determination of what is classed as serious injury. And it would so be... let's say that um, for whatever reason, you'd, you'd have to have everything coinciding together all at once, which is probably never going to happen. So let's say you're out washing your car, this type of weather, nothing on your feet because it's hot or flip-flops, whatever. You're washing the car, you're wet. At that very time, there's a break in the pen conductor. You wouldn't know, break in the pen conductor. Under normal conditions, this device would see it and disconnect but let's say there's an over voltage that's happened in the past you haven't known about it there's been a bit of lights flickering because we've all seen that happen over time and it's made that technology not work and it's caused someone to have a, 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 a shock or it's killed them i don't know how you how you'd prove it in a court of law and all these things would have to happen all at once which is probably highly unlikely but at the end of the day that's what it says that's what we need to do i don't know hundred percent. I think in this circumstance, it definitely should be installed. I just mean a bit more generally when the, the regs updating comes through, it'd be nice to see a bit more detail yeah. around that description if, of if serious injury. Guide, it does gives us it gives us some examples of that, which is very very. But it, it's to the eighteenth. Not it's not been uh, updated for the the changes yeah. in the terminology. So you know the Beamer documents are great. If you've not used them, they're fantastic. They really give us some advice and guidance to help because the regs don't help us sometimes but the BIMA document's quite good the pictures the diagrams are full color they're free to download free to use they're very very good and it it does add a bit of meat on the bones but you know you need to consider it do you do it because it, it should have it or do you do it because if you have to replace the charger it's and you know for the cost of them you know but again consideration to consider it was it was more of a factor i'd say that first comings of spds in more um we were using them more often when the prices were quite high they are lower cost now yeah. and on yeah. most ev installs we do well all of them we install spds i know yeah. that the the charge points themselves have a type of spd i think that's baked into the product standard for evse charge points but, but it's, it's not it's withstand not voltage is much lower yeah. than yeah, um, ours and it's not pre the product so as you say yeah. you're wanting to kind of cover that off and again, there's the whole issue was does somebody notice their SPDs blown one time? How often have these things been checked? How are we putting LED indicators and alarms on them to exactly. alert people? Because people don't yeah. check this stuff. That's the is reality than, in the domestic world. Yeah, and the charger, don't forget, is more than 10 metres away from the DB, yeah. potentially. So would you need a, a, a Type 3 device in parallel connected to it inside the charger? You know, Just again, whack the board we, outside on the wall next to it with an SPD. Uh, and that's, really and... that's, that's coming. Don't worry about that. I, th I think that's Jamie's favourite, isn't he? He loves a BG board on a that's wall good. outside. Like, that's, that's he's always in. on about doing it, isn't he? So he must love it. Yeah, yeah so I think he made it. There. And then back to, to fundamental principles, we should never forget 132.116, where if we're adding to or altering an installation, it, it does remind us that we've got to ascertain that the rating uh, 
and the condition of any existing equipment. And this, of course, includes that of the distributor. So if we're adding another 32 amps and the cutouts only or the meters only rated at 40 amps or 60 amps, you know, we've got to make sure it's adequate for that additional load. And furthermore, if we're relying upon ADS, which we are, earth in a bonding arrangements, if necessary, for the protective measure applied, you know, for the additional alteration, they shall be adequate. So if they're undersized and not there, all these types of things, people don't overlook that. People just go and add and do whatever they want. But, you know, we need to do that. We spoke about new materials and invent, uh, inventions. And again, you know, 133.5 does allow us to do that. And our cable that we're going to be using is an example of that. Uh, and it says, where the use of a new material or invention leads to a departure, the resultant degree of safety of the installation should not be less than obtained by compliance with the regs. So you could argue, if we were to run a separate SWA and a separate CAT6 or whatever it is with it, you know, is it is it safer than that? I would argue it's, it's a better solution, probably safer. Um, but if we do it, then we've got to make sure that such use shall be recorded on the appropriate electrical certification in part six. So there's your EIC again. And we know that we've got three boxes there to record any details of departures. And it would probably be a good idea to include or append to that AIC to justify our departure, the uh, technical spec for that cable. So anybody coming to do an EICR in the future, they might look at it and say, oh, you can't do that. You've got band one and band two together and that cable's not, you know, I've never seen that before. I'm going to put that down as potentially dangerous when I don't have the full uh, facts, full information, documentation. So there you go. Can I, I ask you a quick... Can I yeah. ask you a question before we move on? Based on your opinion, and this is not yeah. to catch anyone out, but just yeah. my view on it. On this certificate, just because we're looking at them, you talk about a new installation, an addition, and an alteration. Yeah. What's your stance on what is what? <laughs> <laughs> so if, if so when a, when would you take a new that's installation? That's a can of worms and a half to chuck in there, Craig. <laughs> yeah. well, if, if, this, if this was an existing installation we're adding to it, that's quite clear that we're adding a circuit. Yeah. So you're if, doing a fuse board change. Is that a new installation? No, well, not a fuse board change, but if you're in a new build house, yes, is that then new? If it's brand new from scratch, it's new. But if you are adding something that's already there, it's an addition, isn't it, or alteration? Just tick them off. Well, that's I, what I do. <laughs> I'm, I, will, yeah, I personally again. would go down the standpoint of if the service head has been changed or it's a new service head, then it's a new yeah. installation. As far as I'm concerned, everything else would be an addition or an alteration. You've got a description there to record exactly what it is you've done, you know, an extent of what it is. And that's the whole point of that, to to describe exactly what work has been carried out. And, you know, you might tick both, that's fine. But it's it will be clear to anyone that's receiving that certification exactly what that certification is for and what it covers. And that, again, is something that's, you know, I've seen loads of, of um, errors with certification and reports that it's not very good. But, again, I, you know... You know what I mean? I only, so I was going to say, I only ask just because I've had yeah. a few conversations in the last week or so where people are going, oh, no, if I put a board in or if I do a board change, it's a new installation, it's a new fuse board. And I've, I what personally didn't work? agree. So I was, Not so exactly. I was curious on other people's yeah. views. But again, you know, that could be some future podcasts looking at certification, paperwork, go, what goes in what box, etc. You know, we're planning on, me and Dave are going to do some, some videos on, certainly within the ICR, the different sections, explaining what should go where, et cetera, et cetera. Because, you know, it's, it's, the information in the regs isn't great. I know there's some notes for whoever's compiling it, but it's not clear. We can, if we can give some examples of that, I think that will help. But in terms of the cable that has been selected for this design, it is a departure. Happy with that? Yeah. Yep. So another, a couple of other considerations. We touched on it a bit last week. Now, within Section 722, which, again, to remind everyone, is additional to Parts 1 to 5 of the regs. It is additional consideration or requirements for where you've got an increased risk of electric shock. And there's currently 20 special installations or locations, EV charging being one of them. So I've got to consider everything in there as well. And there is a requirement under 722.531.3.1 that any RCDs that we select they shall disconnect all live conductors. So you must break the neutral. So on a single phase installation, it's going to be a double pole RCD or RCBO. And on a three phase, it's going to be four pole. Now, it's not clear as to what is what. 
if that kind of makes sense. What I've tried to do, I've used fuse box as an example. On the RCCBs, 6108 devices, you'll generally find a, a, a symbol on the front, and I've tried to blow it up so you can kind of see. Generally, RCCBs are always double pole, generally. And you'll see that the symbol on the front, you can see that both the line and neutral, when it operates, when it opens, they both open together. So it's a double pole device. But on a lot of RCBOs, and this one in particular, it actually says it in the title, fuse box, one pole. On the drawing on the side or on the front there, you can see that the neutral actually just passes through the device. It's a solid link through. So that would not comply. Fuse box do make a double pole device, RCBO, and that's the top right one. But it actually says, if you go up a little bit, Mark, just says it in the, the description there. You can see, look, uh, mini RCBO, one pole plus neutral. So you'd have to check with the manufacturer of the devices. Hagerd currently don't make a double pole RCBO. They only make a single pole device. But they and are some they have got one coming very shortly. I was going to say, and some of your other manufacturers, such as Schneider and stuff as yeah. well, never used to. I don't know if they do now, but I don't assume it. just because it costs more yeah. that they are at that standard because they're not necessarily. So you got you got to consider that. Um so that's something we need to consider. Also, when you look again at the manufacturing instructions that nobody reads, a bit of information that we looked at last week, but it does say as you go down, should an upstream RCD be required due to the reference method uh, or whatever else, and it, it needs to be a type A, ensure that there are no type AC residual protection is upstream of that charger because the DC leakage could cause this not to function correctly in default condition. So, Let's say that our existing installation for this job is a, you know, a high integrity dual RCD board, whatever it is, but there are type AC RCDs in it. We've got a problem because what we can't have is a type AC before a type A. Consequently, we couldn't have a type B before an A, etc. So once again, this is um, referenced again with another great Beamer document. Again, I've put a link to it for you. It talks about coordination shall be given to any RCDs and their type present upstream. And it gives us a lovely drawing. This is straight out of their drawing. And you've got your symbols on it, etc. What I couldn't have is a type AC above that first type A. I can have type AC downstream, etc., but I can't have it above. And you might come across that within an installation where there's existing type AC, but don't forget they are they cannot tolerate any any DC at all. And we don't yeah, know I'm how thinking, much. I'm thinking of a garage circuit. Them. There, Richard, yeah. where you might have a split load board in the house that's yeah. taken out an earth 63 amp circuit off to a garage for somebody to yeah. then put an EV so charge the, point in. And you could think you're put, doing the right thing, putting a type yeah. A in the yeah. garage, but effectively you could blind the AC. Good point. No, no, no information in the regs about it. It talks about selection of RCDs in different types, but there's no, there's no really information in it. If the manufacturer is saying it, and again, the Beamer document's very good. I've put a link there to their uh, RCD selection and application. Absolutely brilliant. But they've also done a guide specifically for RCDs for electrical vehicle charging. Two links, free to download. This, this drawing diagram there is straight out of one of those. So the colour, that makes sense, really good. Again, you know, you've got to, you've got to get as much information as you can so you can make these engineering judgments and you can justify them. So another consideration there that you might not have thought of. And then another one. You might consider, again, we know that within Amendment 2, they changed the EIC where they kind of removed the three, four page inspection schedule, etc. But with our generic schedule of inspections now, uh, I don't know what that's happened. It's moved up a bit. But under item 13, it talks about uh, other special installations or locations. And within Appendix 6 of the regs, it, it, it still lists the full um, uh, inspection schedule like we used to know it and it talks about that you know your schedule inspections you may need to generate a separate list or an additional list with it uh, that's better and you can see there that item 13 look, other special installations or locations and it says within that inspection schedule in the regs it's still there it says the this checklist provides examples of items to aid completion of your schedule of inspections the inspection should include a check of all relevant items in relation to electrical installation However, the list of items, of course, it's not never ending, is it? And you might need to adjust it, etc. So in that schedule, under item 13, it says where the installation includes special installations or locations relating to sections of part seven, 
additional inspection items should be added to the checklist. But there isn't a checklist as such now. You've just got that little bit of information that everybody ticks and nobody really knows what they're ticking, but people tick it. But really, a checklist is, is to make sure that you don't miss anything that you should have done, especially within part seven. So as an example, within part seven, it, it says um, you've got to have a minimum IP rating for ingress of moisture, but also ingress of you know, uh, foreign bodies, but also a minimum IK rating of IK08, etc. I haven't done it, but I can go to the manufacturer's information and it will tell me the IP rating and it will tell me the, the impact rating. And all you're doing is creating a, a checklist relay of what, what should be there with a regulation number and you're inspecting it to verify, because this is verification, it's brand new, that what should be done is done. And it's as simple as that. So you might need to consider that you might need to add an additional list to you know to justify that you've made sure what's there is there and equally with our uh, generic schedule of test results and information we know it goes over two pages now you may need to record additional information on that in terms of remarks so if you've got to measure the point at which the rdc dd device disconnects again you're going to need additional equipment etc to do that there's probably some functional checks that you can you can do there's a lot of other things that we'd need to do that you'd need to record somewhere. You're going to be using probably different test equipment and, of course, details of test instruments. They've all got serial numbers. Even the, the charge adapter that you plug in has got a serial number on it. Should you be recording it? Well, maybe. So, again, another consideration there. And, of course, with EV charging, there is a requirement to comply with the uh, DNA notification process. And I'm sure Mark's filled these bad boys out. But basically... If the load, including the EV charger, is under 13.5 kVA, whatever it is, about 60 amps, you don't need to notify the, the, um, the DNO before. You need to, uh, you need to um, let them know within 28 days. If it's going to be above 60 amps, you need to apply before. So that's another consideration. And one, to get the juices going, just to finish off, we agreed last week, did we not? that this is actually a socket outlet. <laughs> yes, we did. <laughs> so if these charges then that incorporate a socket outlet are installed within a high-risk building or within a car park of the high-risk building, a car park within HMO, a car park within a student accommodation or a care home, should they have an arc fault detection device as well? And finally, little caveat there, and this is one for another time, we may need to install this equipment for this EV charger, not within the meter box, because we're not allowed to do that. And it could be an option where we're installing one of these uh, boards outside. But again, I thought that would be a nice podcast for another time where there's a lot of thought on whether or not they should be and temperature ratings of the devices where they operate within their required times. And that's a black one now, and I like that. That will absorb some radiation from the sun and get warm. And you've got to consider moisture, and even though it might be IP rated, and you've got various different options available, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, another engineering judgment, another good conversation. And I thought that might be nice for another time. There you go. <laughs> so it's not it just a case of selecting a cable and throwing this charger in. You've got other considerations to, you know, to think about. And I've just highlighted a few out of 7671 and a few talking points on it. But it's interesting design. It's pretty good. There you go. Craig. I was going to say, I would be keen to hear people's views for next week about whether not installing an AFDD should be a departure now because of this whole recommended with should um, situation. So, But don't forget, within part one now, they, they give us a table to try and explain to us what recommended is. <laughs> Yeah. Which is a should. So to me, a should. Should you be noting it as a departure? Yeah, and you know what? Yeah, it'd probably never be a problem. But let's say something happened, and you'd have to have all the stars aligning for somebody to for something to happen, and there's a fire, and we didn't. The designer didn't decide to install an AFDD on that socket, and there was a fire. Consequently, there was you know loss of life or something. In a court of law, you'd have seven six seven one to get you out of jail, because ultimately that's what they'd throw at you. And if it says that a recommendation is assured, I'll be asking you, well, Mr. Jones, 
if it's assured, why didn't you do it? And again, as long as you can justify that and you've got engineering judgment, you know, at the end of the day. But, it, you know, it's a, it's a fine balance, isn't it? Because, you, you know, you, your cost of that installation now is whatever it is in hundreds, thousands of pounds, and yet you've got to add another layer, layer of protection, which is good, don't get me wrong. You've got to add an AFDD to it. Is it a good idea? Would it protect the socket and the cable? Probably. And I've seen some uh, cables that have been bought recently that aren't manufacturer approved and the, the tunnel terminations aren't quite large enough and they've been getting extremely hot and melting. A couple of zappies of, I, I don't know, would it lead to fire? Could it? Who knows? Would, it, would an FDD see it? Hopefully. Who knows? But you know what? Good conversations to have, isn't it? It definitely well, it's, it's one we're having tomorrow in my office about what we feel <laughs> some of those departures should be. So it'll be an interesting stance, I'm sure. But don't yeah, forget, yeah. as a departure, as the designer, if you depart from the regs, then you are saying whatever you've chosen to do that's not in the regs is no less safe than the regs. So unless you've got some other device, which is better than an AFDD, then you, you're going to be on a, you know, dodgy ground there. It is a real tricky one at that kind of level, isn't it? And I think that's really the, the art of design and making those calls and decisions when you sign that certificate. Yeah. There's a lot of responsibility that comes with it. And ultimately, that's what you know these podcasts are kind of about, just, just raising a bit of discussion and trying to help other people. I've learned absolutely loads from you two just running through this. And I would love a chat around those outdoor consumer units. I've shared my two pence worth <laughs> on that already yeah. much to the disgust of one or two people on instagram but i make no apologies because i think yeah. i'm right that's your engineering not... judgment mark isn't it ultimately and it'd be nice yeah. i know that nigel's got some feelings on it and jamie as well and you know we've had conversations uh in the office me and dave as well so you know it'd be nice to throw something in the mix and, and try and get a consensus but what i will do is put the concerns of us in the form of the question and i'll put it into the rag which is Wine Regulations Action Group, where I like I like to call it all the, the, the technical minds come together from all the organisations and, you know, the competent person schemes and the IET and other organisations and, you know, we'll pose a question and collectively we'll come up with, a, with what we feel is a solution where it's not clear from the regs and that solar PV was a prime example that we spoke about the other week. That's what that's for and a lot of people don't know it's there on the website um there's a, you know it's quite a bit going on with various things but again as i say you're welcome to come and see us and we'll have a chat about some of the stuff and it's quite interesting really um you know getting involved and ultimately what i want to do is provide answers for the everyday sparks where it's not clear and that's what we have need. the justification and the reasoning for it and i'd love to come about. down and see you guys especially if we get an afternoon yeah. in the pub after we've had a little chat as well that's all Absolutely. better We'll sort you out. I, I want to. Th I want to thank you both for taking part in doing this. It's been absolutely brilliant. I've loved yeah. it. I know that there's people listening really enjoyed it. I'm going to pop these files onto the website. No yeah, that's already in place with the existing stuff we've built up already, and this video will be tagged in alongside that. So anyone who wants to refer to all the stuff we've spoken about, the prior episodes, everything else will all be in that place to do with this particular scenario. Yeah. If there is anybody else who wants to come on and talk about a design or run through something like this yourselves, you are more than welcome. I know we may have rattled a few cages in other parts of social media through doing this, who have kind of design scenarios hidden behind paywalls and in Discord places and stuff that you have to pay to access. That's of no interest to me. We're carrying on with this because I think it's important to try and help people in industry in our way. And um, hopefully people are getting benefit from it. Just thank you, really. Thank you both. Is there anything else you want to add before we leave this one? Um, Dave's very kindly offered to produce another scenario. But again, looking at maybe where we want to take a circuit off an existing sub-distribution board where we've already got a voltage drop. And maybe this time we can look at using the still war armory of an SWA as the CPC because, again, it's other considerations of the tables etc so we've done a few different scenarios but again it will be the same format fairly simple to follow but just slightly different where we may have to go from an existing dv and then we're not working to table 4ab anymore of the regs where we're allowed three percent five percent because you already might have and you will a vault drop of whatever it is so we, we've, we've got to consider that um but also you know it comes up quite a bit and a lot of learners over time have said to me you know well i've always wondered why you've got a sub main SWA on a tray and there's a separate earth run with it. I've always wondered what why that is. So we'll hopefully we'll 
we'll look into that and uh, add a bit more value on that and you know any other suggestions but it saves me making it and Craig making one Dave will make it which is good because again you know he's been in the game the same as me and you know he's, he's pretty good and that'll be interesting because I can listen the and... more, <laughs> more the merrier I look yeah. forward to that um, really enjoyed yeah. Dave coming on last time so if he wants to yeah. come and do that whenever he's yeah. ready you can um, put your pen and paper down for the evening <laughs> and we can grill Dave instead. Yeah. So uh, massive respect, Richard, because I could not yeah. have sat and gone through that design like you have and for <laughs> Craig's input as well. You're both absolute yeah, legends true. and yeah. anyone who doesn't like it can just do one. As far well, as I'm I concerned. <laughs> yeah, I, if it helps and it helps them with the projects through their apprenticeship or for the full-time courses or Sparks as well that answered a few questions, then it's, it's a good thing and I'm proud to be part of it, mate, and I'm honoured to be part of it, to be honest, so... Anything I can do, you know, no problem at all. Brilliant. And, and on that note, we'll leave that one there this evening. Thanks again, guys. We'll see you on the next one. See you later. Bye-bye.